Welcome. And, you know, in today's climate, we hear so much about HBCUs and why they're important. And on today's show, we're going to delve a little bit deeper. We hear the most obvious reason stated as being developing a sense of belonging and sometimes the relationships you're able to build. But on today's show, our very special guest is going to go even further in identifying why HBCUs matter. And she's recently defended her dissertation from Bellarmine University focused on why HBCUs matter and make a difference, particularly for those students in grades K through 12 who have suffered traumatic experiences in education. Because of her work, we now call her Dr. <laughs> Diane Currington. Please welcome her to the show. Welcome. We are Thank glad you. you are with <laughs> us. So I'm going to start with something easy and okay. just asking you, why did you choose an HBCU and more particular for me as a Central State University <laughs> grad, why Kentucky State? Uh, so for me, college was a way out in general. So originally I wasn't even going to Kentucky State. I was trying to go to a predominantly white institution, but there was not enough money. My mom didn't know how to help me go to college, how to get financial aid. And then I received a partial scholarship from Kentucky State University. And so like literally my friends have already moved in. I am still at home. Uh, the Upper Bound program packed me up and I went to Kentucky State University. And I will say that was the best decision I could have ever made in my life. You know, I thought I knew what was best for me, but of course God knows what's better, right? right. And so the moment I landed there, there was nothing but love, support, nurturing. You know, like I was nervous from being away from home, um, experiencing some traumatic things or aces myself. You know, my father died my junior year in high school. Mom was depressed because of that, you know. And so leaving home for the first time was, was hard. But Kentucky State University definitely made it uh, a home away from home. Uh, Excellent. Okay, lovely. so now tell me, were you aware of Kentucky State? Was that in your... <laughs> you, if you will, when you were in high school, were people talking about HBCUs? No. Did you have family members? Not at all. Like, I really literally stumbled under, oh, uh, you know, over uh, into Kentucky State University. Uh, nobody's ever talked about HBCUs. No one ever told me that that was an environment that would support and nurture me. And I no longer had to be ashamed of where I came from or, you know, what has happened to me or what I learned or didn't learn uh, by stepping on uh, HBCU campus. So no, I had no idea. So that was like a different thing yeah, for me. Yeah, so that was just God stepping oh. in in mysterious ways, making it yeah. available. I had a similar experience with Central State. I'd never heard about black colleges. <laughs> and all of a sudden, somebody mentioned, hey, there's a black college. I was like, okay. Next thing you know, I'm on a bus headed to Central State. So my next question, a little bit deeper, and that mm -hmm. is how are you? And I say, how are you? Because mm -hmm. you have just come off of writing a dissertation about a very, very important yeah. topic. Black children, children of color, trauma, the effects of that mm -hmm. and how to deal with that. But you did that during a pandemic. Yeah. Um, and you did that during a year of increased awareness yeah. of racial injustice in our own country. So how are you with all of that? today much better uh but in the middle of writing the dissertation it was oftentimes hard right because you are faced with your own traumatic experience that you thought you healed from or that you didn't even realize was bothering you and so for me when i was doing the research my participants was so important to me and i wanted to protect them because too often we don't protect our own right and we don't care about their mental and, and, and emotional well-being. And for me, that was the most important thing about doing this research. And so what I realized was that I was starting to take on some of their stories and I was starting to develop like anxiety and panic attacks and was extremely stressed out and never experienced that before in my life. But lucky for me, I, I was journaling at the beginning. Um, I took the time out to really listen to my body. And so if I needed a break, I had to take a break. Um, just trying to make sure, and I, 
I talked to a therapist, right? My, I was intentional about finding a therapist before I started this process because I didn't know what this process would bring up for me. Now, let me say this, because uh, when I first met you, and I think I asked you some of those same questions, and I remember you giving me a similar response, and I remember thinking to myself, um, you know, she's probably overreacting. What could it be? And then mm -hmm. I listened to the stories, yeah. and I think I emailed you after maybe two stories and said, oh, you didn't tell me. I think yeah. I'm going to need to take a break yeah. and and it took me probably the better part of two weeks to finish um probably about an hour presentation because it was so traumatic yeah. so why don't we fill our audience in a little bit who may be out there thinking what are they talking about so um tell us about your process so um in writing your dissertation mm -hmm. and deciding you wanted to become dr diane currington um you had to choose a topic a, a mm -hmm. focus area and how did you come about choosing the topic that you did, which was mask off yes. and the rest of it is? Uh, why? Oh, shoot, that title was so <laughs> long. So my dissertation topic, I started out looking at ADHD and trauma because I was so curious. Dr. Nadine Burke Harris um, did this research on how uh, her patients kept coming to her. And we're in the mom was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? These teachers are sending all these forms talking about they need to be evaluated for ADHD. But what she started to find out that they had ACEs, which adverse childhood experiences, um, their children was experienced, their friend being shot or a loss of a parent or um, not being able to make ends meet. So they're hungry. And so she noticed that it wasn't it might have been ADHD, but that wasn't the most important problem. And so she needed to control the traumatic experience within the parents' life to also help the children as well. Okay. And so she noticed when she started doing that, that the children started improving in different ways by just uh, looking at the traumas they experienced and then trying to address and heal those things. And so that led me down a, a rabbit hole of like, oh, so you have to narrow it down more. And so I realized that well, let's talk about the racial traumatic experience that our students of color experience in K-12 education. We don't talk about it enough. And who has told those stories? And for me, that was important and said on the flip side of it, though, I've experienced some racial traumatic experience in K-12 education. But you know how I survived? My foundation was strong because I went to a HBCU and that for that was my lifeline. That was the only way I think I would have been able to get this far. And so. It was really important for me to tell our stories. We don't get to tell our stories. We can run numbers all day long, but there's power in stories, and that was important to me. Excellent. Okay, so you decide that you want to study what these two things have in common, yeah. and you begin uh, in coursework, and then it moves into a phase where you really get participants yeah. to answer questions, mm -hmm. and you begin to study um, what their responses were regarding trauma. So. What was that first set of questions and um, how did you gain participants? Who were the people who said, hey, I'd be willing to tell my story. And why do you think they were willing to do that? So my recruitment process only um, I was only looking for students of color and only students who have either attended, enrolled or um, graduated from an HBCU. And so I only use because of the pandemic, I only use social media platforms to reach out. And so I got over 100 participants. So shout out to all my HBCU <laughs> participants that showed up, right? And so a lot of participants said they showed up just because the title said masked off and they wanted to know more and they was ready to tell their stories. Um, it's, and so from that stage, they had to answer a questionnaire. And so the questionnaire was um, 10 questions, the ace short um, questionnaire, and that can be pretty traumatic in itself. So. I allowed my participants to opt out. I allowed them to score just the numbers and not read the questions that they felt the need to. And I allowed them to call me if they wanted to process with me. And some of my participants, I told them I didn't think it was a good time because I was not trained to be a therapist and to help them um, deal with the type of traumas that they have experienced. And it, I just didn't want to re-traumatize any of my participants at all. Right. So as you can already see, there's a lot more to come in this discussion, but we're delving into mask off and we're del delving into 
Dr. Currington's dissertation about how that trauma is best dealt with through the HBCU experience. There's much more to come when we don't go away. We develop leaders. You represent who I am, who I have been, and who I can be. Change agents. Keeping the spirit of activism and engagement alive and well. That ignite their communities. The community of achievement, one that will demand much of you. And change the world. We set out to do it, and to do it well. We produce 80% of all black doctors and dentists. We generate the black middle class. Strong enough to support the weight of whatever you could dream. We provide a sense of belonging, a celebration of our unique culture. That is the magic of this place. Almost anything can happen here. We are the pipeline that produced many of America's black first. But its mission has been to ensure those firsts were not the last. The nation's VP elect is a product of this distinct heritage. When you attend an HBCU, there is nothing you can't do. We are America's historically black colleges and universities. Hey! Hey, hey, hey! Proud to be Louisville's only HBCU. Simmons College of Kentucky. Maybe you have been chosen for such a time as this. We are Louisville's HBCU. We are back and we are talking today with Dr. Diane Currington. Her dissertation topic, Mask Off, thinking about how trauma of our black students, students of color, is affected um, them during their K-12 education experience and what that looks like when they turn around and go to an HBCU. And so before we talk about the HBCU experience, one of the things I'd like to focus on is um, the traumatic experiences mm -hmm. that you wrote about. Again, before the break, I mentioned that I didn't think that they would be as traumatic reading as they are um, for me um, because I just thought, you know, hey, these are just stories that, but it's kind of like what we've experienced over this last year when we mm -hmm. think about the murder of George Floyd and how we've had to relive that so many times mm -hmm. through the media and what that does to you. So share with us, if you will, mm -hmm. um, what that experience was like and okay. then um, a few of the stories that really paint a picture for our audience mm -hmm. of what we're talking about when we say traumatic experiences in K through 12 education. So for me, while doing this research, I couldn't even watch, I couldn't listen to anything related to George Floyd or anyone else. Um, that became too much for me. And so in order to protect my participants and to take care of my participants and their stories and myself, I had to choose. And so I chose their stories um, over learning more and more information about what was going on in the world. I just couldn't. I tried, but it was it was extremely too much for me. And, you know, sometimes as black women, that's hard for us to say um, because we think we can conquer the world. And, and we can, right? But mentally and emotionally, you have to know when enough is enough. And for me, that was my enough. Um, so some of the stories that really stood out there's so many, but what really stood out to me was most of the stories, they were all over 30 years old and they still remembered everything that happened to them. Um, one was where the librarian told a little girl that she was taking too long to get a, a book. And so she sent her back to class and told her she couldn't get one. Her teacher made her come back and her teacher was advocating for her and she told her to go get the book. The little girl could read the book. The first thing I thought of when I when I heard her story was that black people can't read. You don't deserve to read because if you read more then you start to be smarter than me. And so for me, that was a trigger that started to bother me. And so I had to be intentional about writing about this and making sure that my own personal uh, beliefs or biases wasn't in the research. Uh, One of the things that st stood out to me in that story was and this isn't something we think about. When the teacher came back, brought mm -hmm. her back, advocating for her, 
she was very fearful, the little girl yeah. was, that now she would be retaliated yes. against because, you know, the one teacher stood up for her. And that, you know, was triggering for me because I remember that. Yeah. I remember that feeling, you know, when somebody goes to bat for you yeah. um, and, and especially around something, you know, racial, what that actually feels like. That's a heavy weight. And this is second grade, and she understood that the librarian was being racially uh, discriminating against her and she understood her teacher was advocating for her but she still felt a sense of guilt and shame by the whole incident together. Um, another one was uh, oftentimes you know teachers prejudge black boys by the age of pre, you know three or four mm -hmm. and a, another student was playing in the bathroom one day but forever for the rest of the year the teacher no longer let that student go to the to the restroom and so one day they were in class, he really had to go to the restroom. He asked to go to the restroom. And in the middle of the students drawing each other on this orange chart paper, because he remembered the color of the paper, um, he used the bathroom on himself and then still had to go home on a school bus, just like that. And so um, a lot of them had uncomfortable giggles, right? Um, to try to just it's a defense mechanism right to try Mask to protect off. yeah right. try to protect them from that experience and what had happened to them and uh it was it was really sad one because we all know what's going on and as an educator you just like how are these people able to still be working and so you get so fired up and mad about it um, and this is why I was like, but this is why you're doing the research, because somebody needs to hear these stories. It took 30 plus years for somebody to share their story about what happens to them in first and second grade. Yeah, I remember reading that story, and that was one of the breaking points for me where I was like, I got to step yeah. away. I guess because as a principal, as a former teacher, I've seen that play out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look back in hindsight, you think, oh, my gosh, that was horrible from the child's perspective. You know, from the adult, a lot of times we think disciplinarian yeah. or, you know, we're just. But also we recognize that a lot of times it is racial the way mm -hmm. a student is treated. Um, one of the stories that I'm reminded of is um, the student who wasn't really um, helped with this college application. He mm -hmm. had an eighth grade teacher mm -hmm. who turned out to be his 10th grade yeah. teacher, who then turned out to be his counselor. And because he acted up in eighth grade, she never really forgave him. Yeah. And so she never wrote him a recommendation. She wanted to tell his parents that he didn't deserve to go to college early, even though he was second in his class. Um, but all he was trying to do was leave his home because he was being physically and verbally abused. So for him, college was his only way out. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back to building those relationships, right? If you build those relationships with your students and understand who the whole child is, then you can fully understand how to help them. Because mm -hmm. she would have known then not to ever say anything to his parents, because that would only make things worse for him. I'm curious, were you able to find out if any of the, if any or all of these were always perpetrated by, you know, white teachers mm -hmm. or were some of them also by black teachers? So what I found was they've experienced racial traumatic events and they experienced traumatic events as well, right? Which means that they experienced some for black teachers as well, which they think they're doing tough love, but it's still traumatic, right? And, and it so, can still be racial, right? Absolutely. I ran across many teachers, I'm sure you have, that were black and yeah. were prejudiced against our own people. Absolutely. So that was interesting to find out that, yeah. And then the other scenario of where a white teacher stole the little black girl's whole project. She won a science fair and she took her project and gave it to white students. Mm -hmm. And so that is a traumatic experience for someone who loves science, just like the little girl who wanted to get a book. She loved reading, you know, just like the little boy who had an accident on himself. He loved school. You know, these are supposed to be safe spaces for students and they they can't be safe at home. It can't be safe at school. What are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to act? And so we always need to to see what is the reason for the child's behavior. 
Which is one of the things that I thought was so fascinating about your study because one of the things we promoted on the show and talked about so often is we have to move from asking what's wrong with you mm -hmm. to what happened to you. Absolutely. That when we have a child that's acting out in any kind of way, it's not okay to start there with what's wrong with you? Don't you know better? Are you mm -hmm. stupid? Something happened. And then ask, or, or not ask that at all, but just ask um, what happened? In that moment, in that experience with that person, um, it's the same for adults. Yeah. Don't just always assume that there is a mm -hmm. problem with the individual, but instead that something happened to yes. them. And I think that's what your stories really brought out for me. It reminded me of so many stories yeah. I've heard over the years. And I'm sure, like you said, <laughs> it triggered some things in you as well. What has been your response from people who have heard those stories? So many people are like, oh, my God, I sat down and talked with my child or I allow my child to watch because they never seen anyone defend a dissertation before. And I think it's exciting to watch a black woman. And so they started asking their kids about it and their, or their kids started asking them questions about, you know, what may be happening at school. So it's been a lot of processing and a lot of conversations happening, which is great. I never thought that it would touch parents, maybe more teachers and how we should rethink how we are looking at our students and how we're teaching. And it's okay to not keep teaching the same way you've been teaching for 20 years because it's obviously not working and we don't have the same children anymore. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad that this part came out, but I'm also glad that when we <laughs> come back from the break, we get to talk about how HBCs are uniquely qualified to deal with some of the trauma that we just discussed. So don't go away when we come back, Dr. Currington will share with us next steps. A recent article in Newsweek cited that black colleges produce 70% of all black dentists and doctors, 50% of black engineers and public school teachers, and while HBCUs only account for 3% of the nation's colleges, they account for about 20% of the degrees awarded to African Americans. Did you know that 40% of the African-American members of Congress, 50% of African-American lawyers, and 80% of African-American judges all graduated from an HBCU? Simmons College of Kentucky is just one of America's historically black colleges and universities that can help you pursue and realize your dreams. Simmons College of Kentucky, creating the next generation of thinkers. All right, for our final segment with Dr. Diane Currington, we're going to be talking about why HBCUs are uniquely suited best to deal with our students who have experienced childhood trauma through the school, through the educational system. So we know that you had an experience with HBCUs, <laughs> yeah. but as you interviewed participants, what schools did they attend? Where were they from? Oh, they were from all over. Um, we had, well, I cannot share what schools they're from, but they were all from all over. Um, we even had some one from the Virgin Islands. So it was really unique and cool to just see that everybody had the same experience, right? So everyone kept saying it's an experience. And, and of course, my chair and them are like, what's an experience? What do you mean? I was like, it's, an un, it's, you can't, it's hard to describe, right? It's family, it's love, it's nurturing, it's support, it's, it's you matter, it's help, it's someone that believes in you. You know, like it is black history every single day. It's someone who holds you accountable when you don't want to hold yourself accountable because you feel like you just can't do it anymore, right? It's someone who says, you look like you haven't slept in weeks. How about you take the day off and we come back and take this test tomorrow, right? And so the just the support and the love that you can, you get an HBCU, I just, I still thank God that I went there because I just would not have made it anywhere else. So here in the, in the state of Kentucky, we're blessed to have two um, mm -hmm. HBCUs, of course, Kentucky State University and 
uh, Simmons College of Kentucky, which happens to be the last HBCU. And so uh, Simmons College of Kentucky, of course, is a sponsor of our uh, show today. And as we continue to learn more and more about HBCUs and their importance, talk to me about um, did everyone that you talked to have similar experiences? Were, were there any outliers, I guess, either way? Those that said, ah, oh, you know, it was, it was fine, but I could have went to a PWI and had the same experience. Or was everybody pretty much in the same boat that went to an HBCU? No, everyone that went to an HBCU was like it was the best place they could have went to. You know, they felt accepted, wanted, loved. Um, but everything that did come up in each participant was, I hope you do research about the racial trauma that happens at PWIs. Mm -hmm. And so um, everyone graduated from their HBCU, but not everyone that went on to pursue um, a higher degree finished because mm -hmm. they just didn't, st they didn't have that love or support in a, it, they just couldn't finish at a PWI. Wow. I remember that being an issue when I attended Central State. They didn't have graduate level programs at the time. And so many of us had to leave mm -hmm. our HBCU, attend PWIs. Fortunately for me, I was able to finish. But you're right, a lot of people weren't. Mm -hmm. So what were, what were some of the stories, what were some of the experiences that they shared to you with you uh, about attending an HBCU? One of the participants said I was no longer an outlier. So in her K-12 education, she felt like an outlier because she felt like she had to dumb herself down um, in order to just survive being in a K-12 education. She arrived at her university and was just surprised at how many black smart people there were with higher education degrees, PhDs in science. Oh my God, so she was blown away by that. Um, I had another participant that said even though um, their mentor was white, that they were culturally responsive. Um, they understood who she was and where she came from and never provided her with opportunities that was going to put her and her family in debt. Mm -hmm. So she helped her advance herself and learn things about herself and, and expose her to opportunities, but never jeopardize her and her family's financial situation or her as a, um, as a black woman. So wow. I felt I thought that was powerful because oftentimes we think we only need black people, right? But that's not necessarily true. Right. And we have so, some white accomplices yeah. out there that will go to jail with us. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, so for me, I remember walking on the campus, and uh, I tell this story a lot. Uh, you know, once my parents had drove away and we had to walk to the orientation room or whatever and got settled, I just remember looking around and thinking, oh, my God, everybody here is black. Mm -hmm. Everybody here wants to be here. And I am with, you know, my my brothers and sisters and Absolutely. we are going to learn to get there was nothing greater than that. OK, so tell me um, here in the city of Louisville, we have some predominantly black schools, mm -hmm. elementary, middle and high schools even. And um are they as well suited, you think? Is it the same experience, do you think, as with um, attending an HBCU? Or is there just something different about the college experience? I think that's hard to say. I think there are some things that are the same, right? You see someone that looks at, look like you. You see that representation matters. You see someone hold you accountable and care, right? But I think the college experience is just different, right? Because you're trying to figure out who you are, and so are they, but you come with the same shared experiences, and you do it together. And so you build lifetime of friends and family. You don't even call them friends. You call them family, right? right. And so that's different. And I think in, in K-12 education, you can, you can have those things but you have to get the students to understand the importance of being vulnerable and allowing these people to enter your life and be your family. Mm -hmm. And so that's hard because when you're at home with this family who doesn't treat you like family and doesn't shower you with love, you, you can't understand that, right? You're mm -hmm. conflicted. But when you go away to school and you're on your own, you figure it out for yourself that, oh, this is, this is what this feels like, right? Mm -hmm. To have extended family that's not trash, you know, yeah. so. And how um, that continues to show up because we know one of the things that is so popularized by um, HBCUs is homecoming. So homecoming at an HBCU is very different than oh, homecoming man. at a PWI. Why so? I mean, we, we tell our other friends all the time, like, look, 
if you didn't go to HBC, you don't be bringing strangers because if they, I mean, like, because they just don't understand. And so you're hugging people and you saying hello to everybody and everybody's like, oh, my God, are you trying to talk to someone? So, like, don't bring nobody you dating if they don't understand. You're going to mess up and lose your husband or wife before right. you even get started. But it's just a family reunion. And a lot of people don't understand that. Like, it's people you haven't you i mean this year we suffered everybody on the whole internet was like no homecoming right. what are we gonna do <laughs> like the world felt like it was ending because that's a space that you can go into and and get rejuvenated again mm -hmm. right and, and be surrounded by your professors who love you and still still come out to homecoming and sit with you and talk to you and and you just have a good time together. So it's just now, not the Now, student. let me say this. Here's one thing, and we talked about this earlier because I don't want everybody out there to think everything is always oh, um, well, no. great. So one of the things we <laughs> talked about that um, if you've been to an HBC, you, you know that they are infamous for difficult administration for yes. whatever reason. Um, if at an HBCU, you are going to stand in some lines. Financial you are aid. going to... Um, get some mixed signals. You are going to hear different things from different people. Absolutely. About what you qualify for, your scholarship, your rooming, your app, all of that. But you actually saw that as a positive for when we get out into the real yeah. world. And why? Because you start to learn and you start to realize, like, wait a minute, I need to ask more questions. I need to save my paperwork, right? <laughs> I need to have documentation per our last conversation and email. So you learn these skills. And so for me, I learned too in teaching. Like if I had a situation with an administrator or another teacher, I would follow up per our last conversation. These were the things that was discussed. This is how it was handled. Have a nice day. Right. right. But my HBCU taught me that. So some of these things, it, Financial aid lines suck, okay? <laughs> you standing out there all day. Somebody don't know which dorm you staying in or if you even staying on campus. <laughs> all of that sucks. But in the end, uh, you learn.